Proverbs chapter 22, and we're going to read that familiar verse that we hear so much quoted, and that is verse number six. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And then we're going to use a verse, and you don't have to turn there unless you already turned there, out of the book of Ephesians chapter number six, verse number four, and ye fathers... Provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. As I said, I want to speak to you for a few minutes tonight on the subject of parenting. I'm going to try not to preach all night. Some of you thought I was going to preach all day this morning, and uh, but I'm going to try to be as brief as I can tonight in the message. But I do want to share some things with you about this subject of parents and being a parent. And as I said, I think that it's, it's difficult days for parents to raise their children and bring their children up in these days in which we live. But I believe that God has given us divine instructions from His Word about rearing our children and bringing them up. Now, you can call me old-fashioned or say what you want to, but I still believe the book is the best way to rear your children, going by the Word of God. I don't think you can go wrong. I don't believe the Bible's outdated as, as a lot of our modern-day uh, child psychologists and educators would have you and I believe that the Bible is outdated. I believe the Bible still has some good advice and some good instruction for the parent as well as the children. I think God's order and God's plan for the home and family is still up to date in the Word of God. And I believe that we've seen the results of some of our modern day philosophies. We're seeing the results of it. We're, I might ought to say we're not only seeing the results of it, we're reaping the results of it. But I want to look tonight at this verse of Scripture and I want to just take three things that this verse of Scripture involves. Where he said, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, Solomon, as you know, wrote the book of Solomon as a book of instruction to his son. And the book of Proverbs is really a parent giving advice and instruction to a son. And I think that there are many wonderful truths found in the book of Proverbs. Many things in the book of Proverbs that will be an asset and a blessing to parents as well as children if we would just take heed to the Word of God. Now here before us tonight is a verse of Scripture that has tremendous truth in it and I still believe it. A lot of people do not really believe this verse of Scripture, that it really works. I still believe it works. Train up a child in the way that it should go, and when it is old, it will not depart from it. Let's look at this verse tonight as to what it involves. First of all, let me just look at that first word. Let us just look at the first word. And this verse involves training. Because the first word of this verse is train. Train up a child in the way that it should go. Now, when you look at that word training, there are several things involved when it comes to training. We have seemingly the idea that, re that the responsibility of parents is just to raise their children. Now, I say to you tonight, you can raise a dog. Now, I'm not comparing your children to dogs. I'm comparing the idea of some parents to raising dogs. Because a lot of parents in this generation think that all, the only responsibility they have is to feed them and to clothe them and to shelter them. But the Bible didn't say raise up a child, but it said to train up a child. Now, I, I've used this illustration before. I don't know, well, I've mentioned my old dog, Tuffy, a lot of times. I used to have a Cocker Spaniel named Tuffy Samine that we finally had to execute him. 
We had to send him to the pound, have him put, well, I didn't have him put to sleep. God spared me of that. And let the fellow who adopted him, after he bit him two or three times and laid his hand open and several stitches in it, and uh, then he finally gave in and took it back to the pound and they put it to sleep. But I used to have a dog named Tuffy. He was a cocker spaniel. He was a thoroughbred. By the way, uh, that's no guarantee in the absence of training that you're going to have a good dog. You see, we, we just loved that dog and fed that dog and, and treated that dog good, but I didn't spend any time training it. Now, my next-door neighbor, he went to the pound and bought a $10 dog, but he trained his. And there was a vast difference in the outcome of the two. Now, he spent a lot of time with that dog, but that dog obeyed him far more than most children obey their parents. That dog had an imaginary fence in his mind. He would never come in our yard. He'd come over just like there's a fence and stop. He'd do anything. It was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. That dog do anything that man told him to do. But he spent hours and hours and hours training. There's a difference in training and raising. And there's a difference in raising children and training children. And a parent's responsibility before God is not just to feed them and clothe them and put a roof over their head, but we have a God-given responsibility from God as parents to train our children. We, I mean, we, we've got to assume that responsibility or we're going to pay the consequences down the road. And this generation is doing just that. We're paying the consequences of the lack of training. Now, our children wear better clothes, live in better homes, drive new automobiles, and have everything that life has to give as far as material things is concerned. But many of them are lacking in training that comes from their parents. Now, look at this verse. He said, train. Train up a child. That implies that there has to be some education involved. There has to be some enlightenment involved. There has to be some instruction. There has to be some passing on of information into the lives of those children to, treat, to teach them the things that are right, to teach them the things that are wrong, to spend time training that child by way of information and education and enlightening them to the things in their life. But secondly, it not only implies there must be a form of education or passing on of information, but there also uh, implies that training comes from experience. Now, what do you mean by experience, preacher? Well, experience, and what I mean by experience is not just giving your child information and not just educating them about things, but experiencing things with them and teaching your children by experience. Now, Jesus taught his disciples that way. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28 and verse 29, he said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, notice what the next verse said. And take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I'm meek and lowly in heart and you shall find rest unto your souls. You know what Jesus did? Jesus invited you and I to come unto him and to take his yoke upon us and to learn of him. He didn't say learn about me, but he said learn of me. Jesus said, come to me. Get in the yoke with me and you can learn of me by experience. You can walk with me, work with me, and we can learn and I can teach you by experience. Learn of me. In other words, experiencing things together. You know how you grow as a Christian? 
You take that yoke upon you and you learn of him. He's the source of your learning, but you're in the yoke with him. You're experiencing the same things that he's experiencing. And you're living and walking with the Lord Jesus. And you go hand in hand and you grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, don't you think that Jesus is our example of, of a teacher? And if that is a way that he teaches his children to learn of us, that we ought to experience some things with our children. There's some things that you cannot teach your children just by passing on information to them. But you need to experience some things with them. Example. How many of you fellas can teach your little boy how to play baseball by just sitting down with, with a book of knowledge about baseball and just passing on information to him about baseball. No, if you really want to teach him and train him how to play baseball, you know what you'll do? you get a ball and a bat and a glove and you get out in the yard with him. And you'll play ball with him. And he'll learn to play ball but, and you will experience that together. Now, that's one illustration, but that's not my point. Our children need to be trained by experience, by praying together, by reading the Bible together, by going to church together. There are just some things that you cannot pass on to your children by information or education, but there must be experimentation. You need to experience some things together with your children. Parents need to pray together with their children. Parents need to go to church together with their children. They need to read the Bible together with their children and experience things together in a spiritual sense, together with their children. There are just some things that cannot be passed on and, and, and lessons that cannot be really taught any other way. Now there's a third thing in relation to training a child. And it's not only by education and, and experiment or experience. But there's a third way to train and that's by example. Because you see, there will come a time in your child's life that he will cease to do what you say, and he will begin to do as you do. Let me say that again. There'll come a time in your child's life that he will cease to do what you say do, and he will begin to do as you do. And at that point in time, you as a parent had better be doing the right things before that child. You had better be the right example. Many, 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 many children grow up to be just like their parents. Now, that can either be a blessing or that can be a curse. If they've seen the right kind of example, if they've experienced the right kind of training and been informed about the right things, then that is wonderful for children to grow up and become like their parents. But if parents are not experiencing things with their children, they're not educating them about the things of God, and they're a poor example to their children, it can be a tragedy. Much of the heartache in this world tonight is because a little boy grew up to be just like his dad. Or a little girl grew up to be just like her mom. We need to put the right kind of example before our children. What kind of example are we giving? I mean, right now. Right now. If, if, if the way you live today. And not the way the church thinks you are, not the way your fellow man thinks you are, but the way that you and God and your family know that you are. If your children turn out just like you spiritually, what kind of Christian will they be? 
What kind of an example are we giving our children? What are we teaching our children by example? I tell you something that concerns me, and we're already dead tonight anyway. I mean, I mean, you know, it, I'm just getting down here where we live, and you know, I was fired up this morning, hooping and hollering and preaching, and my sleeves rolled up, and and y'all down here tonight, so I'm just gonna get down here where y'all at and preach to you a while, okay? Amen. Instant in season, out of season. I'll just adjust to the situation. <laughs> Amen. But you know what concerns me is the kind of example that we're portraying to our children about the things of God. Now, listen, I'm not talking about the world out there. I'm not talking about the unsaved world. We know what kind of example they are to their children. Many children out there in the unsaved world, they see their mom and dad shoot needles in their arms and they see them drinking alcohol and doing all of the ungodly things that, that the world does. And, and, and it's no wonder that we have so many heartaches and heartbreaks from society and from young people in society. But I'm not just talking about them tonight. I'm talking about what kind of example do children of Christian parents see from their parents. And what really concerns me is this. I was talking to Brother Junior about this. You see, there's probably 20 years difference in mine and his age. Now, you, I hope you take this the way I'm going to say it. I'm just going to say it the way it is. And, 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 and you know, I love you. And, and if, I guess what I'm trying to say, for shoe fits, wear it. I guess what I'm really trying to say. But I told Brother Junior, I said, you're coming along behind me. And, and I'm 44 years old. And Brother Junior's about 26, or I think, somewhere along there. Close, 25. And, and he's close to tw approximately 20 years behind me. I said, you know what that means? I said, that means that the, that the parents that I'm pastoring right now that have little children, that means you're going to be pastoring their children. And if I can look at, as a pastor and I can see that many of the couples in this church who have children, their priorities are far from being on the Lord. They're so entangled with, a, with the world around them. They're so wrapped up in making money and living after pleasure and playing ball and taking trips and to the mountains and to the lakes and all of this. And, and I mean, they'll average about two to three Sundays out of the month to church. And, and most of the time nowadays we call that faithful. I said, if that's a kind of example that these young people are coming up under looking at their parents, that God's not really first in their life and they got all these other things ahead of God. I said, do you know what kind of church you're going to be pastoring? If you think I'm losing my hair, do you realize what kind of church you're going to be pastoring? What a job you're going to have on your hands? Folks, what I'm saying is that we're losing, we're losing something with every generation that passes off the scene and comes along. I'm seeing right here, and believe me, I am not trying to offend you or make you mad, but I'm trying to wake some of us up tonight. I've seen some of the old timers pass off the scene in the five years that I've been the pastor right here at this church, and their children can come nowhere near walking in their shoes. They're nowhere near the Christian that their fathers and mothers that are passing off the scene are. We're losing something. And then their children is another step behind them. And we're going the wrong direction. And we're following the example. I mean, what I'm saying, we've got to put an example out there to our children that Jesus comes first. Well, this is a case in point, but I'm just going to use it as a supposition. What kind of example should we be, preacher? I'll give you an example. I've never seen, and I don't want to get off on this and get on a soapbox. I've never seen a generation is so sports crazy in all my life. But suppose your little boy plays in the Little League. And by the way, I've been told that Little League plays on Wednesday night now. 
That's a shame. That's a shame. You know what I'd do if, if my little boy played on the Little League and he had a game on Wednesday night? I'd tell that coach in the presence of my little son, Mr. Jesus comes first in our life, and Johnny won't be at the game tonight. We go to church on Wednesday night. And I'll assure you one thing, that little boy, when he grows up, he's going to remember hearing his dad tell that coach that Jesus comes first on Wednesday night, and we go to church over playing ball. I said, case in point, case in point, for a fact, I heard it in my own ears. Lately, I'm not going to tell you where I was at, but I heard somebody say, Preacher, we're not going to be able to be at Revival Wednesday night because little so-and-so's got a ball game. What, what are we, you know what we're teaching that children? We're, now listen, we may pray with him at night by the side of his bed before he goes to bed. And we may read him the Bible and we may take him to church on Sunday. But, and, and we may put that information into his mind and tell him that Jesus is first. And we may experience a few things spiritually with him and pray with him and, and do those things. But our example is saying ball's more important than Jesus. Now, I'm not going to get popular preaching this way, but, but really, I'm just going to tell you the truth. You know it so. I challenge some of you parents tonight, if your children playing ball on Wednesday night, missing prayer meeting, appeal to the coach. The world protests everything. Why don't we Christians buck up once in a while and say we're not going to go along with it? We're not going to do it. We're going to be. The, we're going to teach our children Jesus comes first. Well, I don't have to. I don't think I have to keep on and on. I think. That, that just that one example right there tells you we need to be the right kind of example to our children. We need not only to tell them Jesus comes first, we need to show them that Jesus comes first. We need to train them. There's a lot of things involved in training. Notice something else. Not only does this verse involve training, but this verse involves time. He said train up. A child. And that word train up simply means, like over in the book of Ephesians, to bring up. In other words, start early and stay with it till the job's finished. Start when they're small. Train up a child. That involves time. It takes time to be parents. Now listen. If you don't have time for your children, you're too busy. It's just that simple. If you do not have time for your children, you're not going to get but one chance in life to be their parent. And you better take advantage of that. And if you don't have time, then take time to be a parent to your children. My foremost regret as a parent, my daughter's sitting here tonight and she's 22 years old. And my foremost regret is that I did not take more time with her when she was small. When she was, when she was growing up in them tender years. And I was off running here and there and, and, and preaching and, and, and doing the work of God and pastoring the church and, and doing just like I'm doing now. I don't have children. I can, I can do it now and get away with it. But there's some times I should have, some time that I should have given her that I robbed her of that I look back now and regret. See, time's one commodity you can't recall. Folks, your children are going to, before you know it, they're going to be 15, 16, 17 years old. They're going to be grown before you know it. And time's going to be gone. And that's the most important thing you give. Train them up. It's, it requires time. It requires time. You've got to take time for your children. Now, I don't have any qualms. And I, you know, with mothers working, I mentioned that in passing in one of the other messages on the home as I was preaching. But I want to tell you something. If you sacrifice the life of your children to drive a second car or live in a bigger home, you're playing with fire. You're going to reap it in your children. It may take 15 years for that seed to come up.
though. If you don't have time to be a parent and work too, quit your job, but don't quit being a parent before your children are grown. Now this, listen, this is not good preaching in this modern day time in which we live, but this is good Bible preaching that your kids ought to, have, ought to be a priority to you and you ought to assume the responsibility that God has given you to train them up and that implies taking time with your children. And I'm not against you ladies working. I'm not against you living in a nice home, driving a good automobile and wearing nice clothes and having things. And enjoying life. But if you have to do it at the sacrifice of your kids, it's not worth it. It's just not worth it. You cannot become a successful parent overnight. There, I mean, there's no overnight success stories in parenthood. Anything you're good at takes time. Is that not so? I mean, just common sense tells us that anything you're good at takes time. You men that work on the job, we have professional people, men in this building and in this church that are successful. You know how you got successful? You spent some time developing and training and becoming successful in what you do. Isn't it amazing that we recognize that anything we're good at takes time and we're willing to devote that time, but somehow or other we just feel like that we can just go to the hospital and the baby's delivered and we just come home and without having to invest any time or effort into it, we're just going to be successful parents. We're fooling ourselves. We're kidding ourselves. You're not going to be a good parent unless you invest some time in being a good parent. You're not just going, you're, you're, you're not just going to go to bed and wake up with, with a new addition to the family and just automatically find yourself a successful parent. You are going to have to invest some time in it. Train up a child. Start early. Stay with it till the job is finished. So this verse implies time. And every one of us ought to want to be good parents. Boy, I, the thing about it is that I look back and, and, and see, the, here's the thing about being a parent. You can't undo your mistakes. You, you can't go back and undo. I, I, I've, I made some mistakes. I wasn't a, a perfect uh, father. I'd be the first one to admit that. I wasn't a perfect parent. But the things that I did wrong, I can't, go, I can't go back and undo. What are you saying, preacher? I'm trying to get it over tonight that some of you young couples in here that's rearing your children, you better invest some time in being a good parent. That's the only way you'll ever be one, is put some time into it. Now notice something else about this verse. Train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. This verse involves training. This verse involves time. This verse involves truth. Train up a child in the way. Train up a child in the way he should go. That involves truth. You've got a decision to make, parents. Am I going to bring my children up God's way? Or am I going to bring my children up the world's way? Am I going to let the world and the philosophy of the world decide what's best for my children? Or am I going to let the Word of God and the Lord decide what's best for my children? Train up a child in the way he should go. There's the controversy on which way to go. That's where the clash is at. Which way to go? Well, turn with me. Turn with me over to the book of Ephesians for a moment. Now, there's, there's much that I, I'm not going to have time to get into. We, we're going to continue this, the Lord willing, next Sunday night. Get to the children's side of things. But we've got to bring them up God's way. And that's the best advice. I, can, I mean, that is the best advice I can give parents. 
is for you to realize the Word of God is not obsolete. But some of the best up-to-date child psychology is found in the pages of God's Word. And what God says in this book will still work today in bringing your children up. Now, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, ye fathers... I'm not going to take the time to get in that word fathers, but if you do a word study on that word fathers, not just talking about the father of the children, but ye fathers is really a word that is used in other places in the Bible as parents. So it's really talking about both parents here, mother and father. But he said, ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. And I think a simple way to just get that over and then get on to where I'm going is this. Provoke not your children to wrath. In other words, anger begets anger. Don't rear your children in anger. Don't discipline your children in anger. All you're going to do is provoke them to anger. Provoke them to wrath. And wrath has got a ring of revenge in it. And you discipline your child in anger and your child's going to try to figure out a way he can get even with you. you. Do you adults remember those days when you used to try to figure out a way to get even? Now listen, my mind is not warped. My personality is not eternally bent, but I've had a whipping or two in my day from an angry father. And I love my dad and respect my dad as much as anything. I've disciplined my daughter at times in anger. That's wrong. I've been guilty of that. But you want me to tell you what I used to do when I was a kid when my dad would do that? I'd try to figure out a way to get even. I'd think, I'd just pout and sull, you know, and, and I'd get off in the room and I'd think, I wish I could die. Boy, they'd be sorry they treated me this way if I could just die. None of you, if y'all, am I the only one here that's ever thought that? Well, if I was to die, they'd be sorry they treated me this way. That's, that is provoking your children to wrath. That is anger begetting anger. That's not the way to discipline your children. We've all made those mistakes. The easiest time in all the world to discipline your children is when you're mad. But most of us don't even mean what we say when we're mad. Is that not so? We don't really mean what we say half the time when we're mad. Most of the time we say more than we need to say when we're mad. Amen? Now, anyway, ye fathers, ye parents, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And that word nurture in verse number four means discipline. That word admonition means warning and instruction. Bring your children up in the discipline and in the instruction and warning of the Lord. Bring your children up in the ways of the Lord. And in order to bring them up in the right way, Train up a child in the way he should go. And the way he should go sometimes in order to get him to go the way he should go is going to require nurture and admonition. It is going to require the right kind of discipline and the right kind of warning and instruction of the Lord in that child's life. Now we've come a long ways from the pages of God's Word about disciplined children, but it's still in the Bible. I still believe the book of Proverbs. Do y'all still believe the book of Proverbs? In fact, when I was growing up, you talk about, you know, they've outlawed corporal punishment now. Man, when I was growing up, it was almost capital punishment. <laughs> say, you say, your parents believe in corporal punishment? They almost believe in capital punishment. What does the Bible say? You, as I said, you got a choice to make. It's either God's way or the world's way. Now, the world says you're going to warp their personality. You're going to ruin them for life. 
I said the other Sunday preaching, I think I could have turned out a lot worse than what I have. Look with me in the book of Proverbs for a moment. Let me just remind you of some verses right here. Turn back over to the book of Proverbs and let me, let me read you some of these verses. The school system. I mean, listen, it's in trouble. We, we have three or four school teachers in this church. And I praise God for you. I, I thank God for you to do what little you can do from a spiritual aspect. And, I mean, it's like bootlegging Jesus into the public school system. But, you know, when I was growing up, they had corporal punishment in the school. If I got a whipping at school, I got another one when I got home. Now, if they were to get one at school, the parents ready to go down there and whip the teacher. Things have changed. Things a lot different. Well, I'm not sounding self-righteous. Don't, don't accuse me of that. I'm not sounding self-righteous. I just believe things done God's way will work. But I just challenge you to compare generations. You compare the generation I grew up in and compare the generation that's coming up today. I rest my case. Nothing more needs to be said God's way still works. We just need to get back to it. Look at Proverbs. Let me just read these. Now, I'm just going to hit these verses and, and, and go, and we're going to be through in just a moment. Proverbs 13. Many of you have read these verses. We just don't believe them anymore. Proverbs 13, verse 24. He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes and that word betimes means early that means start when he's early now you wait till your son's 15 years old and you try to take a belt to him you're going to be in trouble I'm not saying start when he's in the crib I'm just saying do like the Bible says start early if you love him and it's not going to kill him it's not going to warp his personality and I know we got members in this church You've already told me you don't believe in corporal punishment. You don't believe in any kind of physical punishment. Your children, now you may not see it the way I see it, but you're going to have to hear it the way I see it. And I'm going to tell you, I believe what this book says. You had enough nerve to tell me what you believed. Do you think I ought to cow down in my preaching and not preach what I believe? <laughs> I'm not being smart. I'm just, I'm just telling you. That, that the book said, He that spareth his, his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes or early. Look in Proverbs 19 and 18. Proverbs 19 18. Chasten thy son while there is hope. Let not thy soul spare for his crying. Isn't that good advice? Look at the next verse. A man of great wrath shall suffer punishment. For if thou deliver him, yet thou must do it again. Verse number 19 starts out when they were a child. He said, now, he said, you better... Chasten thy son while there's hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crying. He's not talking about a child anymore, but a man of great wrath shall suffer punishment. For if thou deliver him, yet thou must do it again. If you let him by, it's going to come up again. You let him off, it's going to come up again. It's going to come up again. There needs to be discipline in every home. Proverbs 22, verse 15. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. 
Look in Proverbs 23, verse 13. Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with a rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with a rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Now, I'm not for child abuse. I'm not teaching or preaching child abuse, nor is the Bible teaching child abuse. But it is teaching discipline in the life of children. Do it early. Start early with it. Be consistent with it. There are times when there needs to be physical discipline and punishment in the life of that child for disobedience. There are times when there needs to be admonition, warning, and instruction when you can sit down. And I want to tell you something. Some of the hardest whippings I've ever had in my life is when my dad sat down across from a kitchen table with a broken heart and tears running down his face and just wore me out up one side and down the other. There's more ways than, there's more ways than physical discipline. There's also admonition and warning and instruction. That's part of it too. And if you'll pray and seek the will of God, he'll give you the discernment and the wisdom to know when to apply which one needs to be applied. But both of them in the Bible, both of them is a part of a child's discipline, and they all need that discipline. Now what about it, preacher? Train up a child the way that it should go. When it grows old, it will not depart from it. Well, notice that word old in that verse. Now, I'm not trying to prop this verse up or crutch it up. I believe the Bible says what it means means what it says. But that verse is a problem for a lot of people. In fact, I've had a problem with it. Train up a child the way that it should go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. I picked up on something. There are four stages that most children go through in growing up from childhood to adulthood. In relation, in the relationship they have with their parents. The first stage is they idolize their parents. Their parents, their dad is the greatest dad in all the world. Their mom is the greatest mom in all the world. You remember those days? There's a stage that children go through, they idolize their parents. They can do no wrong. They're always right. They're, they're the greatest people in all the world. But there's a second stage that children go through on their way to adulthood, and they not only idolize their parents, but then they demonize their parents. Can you remember when your dad was the meanest man that ever lived? I can remember when my dad, I thought his purpose on earth, that the reason God put him on this earth was to make my life miserable. And any time he saw me about to have some fun, he would jump in there just in time to stop me. <laughs> Y'all remember that? <laughs> the reason this is so funny, it's true. I mean, we can identify with that. We go through a stage, we demonize our parents. We think that they're just as mean as a devil, so to speak. And they're mean to us. They're cruel to us. Nobody else's mom or dad is as mean to their children as you are to me. Your parents ever heard that? Some of you have said it, hadn't you? Then there's a third stage children go through on the way to adulthood, and that is they not only idolize their parents, they demonize their parents, but then they scrutinize their parents. And when they go through that age, you know what they're always doing? They're always trying to find a way to justify what they want to do that their parents disagree with. And they said, well, I bet you did this when you was growing up. They scrutinize the past. They, they go back to the past. And I bet your mom and dad didn't do you this way. I bet you they let you go here and they let you do this. And, and they, huh? And they scrutinize and they, and they compare, trying to find a way to justify. And if they can't do it from the past, then they'll get into the present and, and when they're telling you that you're wrong about something, some of you young people, listen, you'll say, well, what about you? You do this and so. Y'all still with me? Y'all still identify with this? 
children go through a, a time that they scrutinize their parents and they try to compare themselves to them and they try to compare faults to justify what they're wanting to do that their parents disagree with. Am I, am I very far off base, young people? Am I pretty close to the way that it really is? But then, children on the way to adulthood go through a time when they humanize their parents. And thank God for that. You see, I can identify with all those stages in my life. I can go back. I was thinking today. I can go back. I can remember. Remember, I went through that stage. I idolized my dad. Then I can remember when I demonized my dad. I can remember when I scrutinized. And I tried every way in the world to, to catch them at something that, that I could use as leverage to get to do what I wanted to do. And I scrutinized every move they made. And I tried to find fault with them and to compare them with me and, and everything else I could think of. But then along about the time when I was becoming an adult, I began to humanize my parents. And I realized that my parents were human and that humans are subject to falter. They're subject to fail. They're not perfect. But the end result was that I thank God for an old-fashioned mom and dad that loved God and that loved me. And in spite of all their mistakes, they did the best they could to raise me and bring me up right. And I respect them to this day for it. Some of you people remember going through those same days and you look back now and you realize that you didn't, you, did, you were not trained and brought up by perfect parents. And you realize that they were human. They made some mistakes. They didn't do everything just right. But all in all, they loved you. And they did their best to bring you up right. And to see you turn out right. And young people, I don't know what stage you may be going through. But the end result is that mom and dad's human. They're not perfect. But all in all, I believe a Christian parent loves his child and wants to see them turn out right. And they do the best they can to see to it that that takes place, that their children grow up and turn out right. Now, back to verse 22. I don't know if that answers it for you or not, but I think during the process of training, there's some painful years that takes place. In some cases, now what I've said is not not hundred proof as far as the four stages children go through, but most of us can identify with that. But I can remember times when I went through these stages, but the end result was I'm living in that imparted truth tonight that my mom and dad imparted to me when they trained up a child the way he should go. I wouldn't be here tonight if it were not for a mom and dad that trained me up in the way that I should go. And when I'm old, or now that I'm getting older, I've not departed from that, but I'm living that. Your children, they may go through stages at times. They may differ with you about things. But as I said, the day's going to come. They're going to come back to that point in time. They're going to realize that you're human and that all in all, you've done a good job and, and done your best to try to bring them up in the ways of God. And they're going to walk in those ways. Some go astray. Parents don't understand it. I've had, I've had weeping parents. Well, I've had weeping parents tell me, Brother Berman, I don't know where I went wrong. The Bible says, and I've had them, you don't know how many times I've had this verse quoted to me. The Bible says, train up a child the way that it should go. When it grows old, it won't depart from it. And Brother Berman, I did the best I could to bring my children up right. And they're away from God today, and they're not living for the Lord today, and they're not in church like they should be, and they're not living the way they was taught, and they're not living the way that I brought them up. And I don't understand that, but, but, but I know that the Bible says that, train up a child. And I said, yes. And the word of God's true. And the day's going to come when that truth that you've imparted to them is going to come out. They're not going to depart from that truth. 
They're not going to get away from that truth. That truth is going to have the final say that you've imparted when they're children. You haven't lost the battle yet. Let me give you this illustration while they come. I was thinking about this today. I said, Lord, I think I know what I'm trying to say, but I, I couldn't figure out a way to say it. When, when you train up a child the way that it should go, when it grows old, it will not depart from it. And I thought, how can I get this over in the truth of what the Word of God is teaching? And I sought for an example, and, and I never could figure out a way to say it. And I walked upstairs, and I laid down on the bed, and here's a thought that come to me. Jesus disciplined, and as I mentioned this morning, that word discipline comes, or the word disciple comes from discipline. And the disciple is one who's disciplined to follow. Jesus called his disciples and he said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And he trained those disciples. And he taught those disciples. And these ways of training that I mentioned by experience and by example and by enlightenment, those characteristics are found in the way Jesus taught his disciples. But you know what happened? We look at Peter, and the Bible talks about that Peter denied the Lord and walked away from him. But if you read that story, Peter was not the only one who forsook the Lord. The Bible said that all the disciples forsook him and fled. They went away. They went through a period of time. They walked away from the Lord and forsook the Lord. And he died on that cross. But you know where you find them in Acts? In the book of Acts chapter 1, you find them together in one accord in the upper room doing what Jesus called them to do to start with. They went astray. They erred from it. But the end result was they never departed from those early instructions and that early calling and the, that early teaching and training that Jesus gave them when he's here upon this earth. Now, your children may go astray, but the end result is if you made that investment early, the day's going to come when they're going to be living in the truth that you imparted to them. I'm convinced of that as much as I'm an inch tall, that God will honor his word if parents will honor his word. If you'll honor God's word in the lives of your children, God will honor his word to you. Well, every head's bowed and every eye closed. We're going to pray, stand and sing in a moment. Father, I thank you this evening for the message of the Word of God. I thank you for the truth of your Word that don't ever change. I pray tonight, Lord, as we've shared these truths, Lord, that we have many parents that are members of Floyd Road Baptist Church. We have some, Lord, whose children are grown and have children of their own. We have others who have about raised their children. They're late in the later years of their teenage days. Some are graduating from school, about to enter the world. We have others, Lord, that have children in the nursery. We have others who have children in children's church. And Lord, I pray that if no one else has heard anything I've said tonight, these mothers and dads of those children in the nursery and the moms and dads of the children in, in children's church, oh God, if somehow latched told of the truth of your word that it still works today and that by your grace and by your help they'll shut out the philosophies of this world that says your word don't work anymore. And they'll make the divine choice to bring their children up God's way. And they'll tune their ears and their heart to you. And they'll listen to you. And that you will make them the parents they need to be. In order that the next generation to come might have hope. Oh God, move I pray upon our hearts and help us to see the importance of what we've tried to share. And Lord, I realize tonight that in our weak, stammering, stumbling way, Lord, at times it doesn't seem that we do justice to the Scripture, but somehow I pray that you'll take the truths of your word tonight and you will not let it escape the hearts and the minds 
of the parents that's in this place tonight. Help us to be the right kind of church. Lord, that, that conveys and preaches the truth as it is to men just like they are. And I pray that your word will be received tonight by your spirit. Blessing the invitation now if there are parents here or anyone here in this building that need to come and do business with you, help them to do so tonight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.